Hey, it's now my great honor and uh, to introduce Angela. Angela Sterrett is our next speaker. She's going to be coming in by Zoom. And Angela is a reporter with CBC. She's been there for almost 20 years. She is an award-winning journalist, author, and artist from the Git and Max band of the Git Sand Nation. She, you might know her from her column, Reconciliation This, or, sorry, Reconcile This, or from her podcast that she's working on called Land Back. She's got a book called Unbroken. Her topics are very topical, including the fact that she has covered the story of an indigenous man and his then 12 year old granddaughter who were arrested while trying to open a bank account with BMO. That was settled today. So she may or may not want to speak to that, but I just saw that on my news, on my CBC news alert that came on my phone. So, uh, and Angela has so many awards, I can't begin to list them all. She's a fantastic speaker and we're very, very fortunate to have her here. And there she is. Hi, Angela. Welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, for that lovely introduction and for the welcome. And I'd also just like to recognize and honor uh, the reality that I am here on Squaholtmush, Musqueam, Unslewatoth territory, the unceded territories of the people of this land. And that's something that's been super important in my career and that I'll be talking a little bit about today. Um, I am also just wanting to um, acknowledge that this is over Zoom and Zoom gets exhausting very quickly. And so I will give a bit of a truncated talk, um, but leave it open for, for questions at the end, um, just to make it a little bit more dynamic. Um, and I answer all kinds of questions, but one of the things that I've um, been doing more recently is um, not answering questions that are racist. <laughs> um, so I'm open to, to all kinds of questions for people that are, that are dedicated and committed to learning about, in particular, Indigenous people. But um, yeah, it's sometimes the questions get um, a little bit uh, derogatory. Um, I gave my first talk in person uh, last week and it's very different. So it's really nice to see everybody there and I wish I could be in person. Unfortunately, um, CBC does not allow that yet, but hopefully very soon. Um, so yeah, my name, my name is Angela Starrett. I'm Gixan and from, from the community of Gitnamax. And I've been living here on uh, Coast Salish territories since 2016, I've moved uh, from to be stationed with CBC and Yellowknife in Winnipeg and in Toronto and moved back recently. And yeah, started doing a column and started doing a lot of more investigative reporting. And that's right today, um, Maxwell Johnson and his granddaughter from the Heltzik Nation were able to settle a human rights case against the Bank of Montreal where they were handcuffed in front of a busy street while they were trying to open up her first bank account because the teller became suspicious of the large amount of money in his account. All of that we found out through the transcripts of the 911 call. So a very disheartening story and one that really illuminates the racism in Canada. And that's something that is gonna be the focus of my talk today. And I know you are all doing incredible work when it comes to literacy. And I think one of the most important things um, as a university professor that I've taught about all this semester and as someone who's also a mom of, a, um, of a, an 11 year old, media literacy is so critical. Um, but also for me, what's, I wouldn't say more important, but just as important is indigenous realities literacy. And so I've spent most of my life trying to turn the tide of journalism when it comes to reporting in Indigenous people, about Indigenous people. And so one of the things that I think is tremendously important right now in this juncture of our time in this point in history is how we're perceiving, how we're seeing, and how we're relating to ourselves on this land and to Indigenous people. That's something we've had a big problem with in Canada. We've been taught to understand and reflect on the nation of Canada as being peaceful, of being sort of the paradisimo of the world. And within that vein, we've seen ourselves as pioneers. We've seen ourselves as conquerors. We've seen ourselves as the first in this territory. And within that, we've 
ignored an entire population of people. So I want you to all think about this maybe in a little bit of a different way that might help you to understand this a little bit more because you know, I try to situate myself as an indigenous person, but I also am white as well. And so I try to understand what it's like to come to this point, not learning about indigenous people in school, in elementary, in high school, in university, in our social groups, we become very sort of tribe orientated um, when we're not seeing the other side. And that comes a, has to do a lot with, with media literacy as well. So I want you to think about our understanding of indigenous people within a lens of fake news. And I want you to think about how that contributes to our consciousness and why. And it's actually a lot more deeply rooted and physiological than you may understand. So I recently learned about this thing called deep fakes. I don't know if people have heard of that, but it's something new to me. It's where we, um, I don't wanna say we like I'm doing this, <laughs> but people in our society are creating videos or a video of a person in which their face or body has been digitally altered so that they appear to be someone else. Um, it is typically used maliciously to spread false information and it's used with machine learning technology that manipulates or fabricates audio or video recordings to show people doing and saying things that they never did. Um, so they appear very, very real. Um, I just saw one the other day um, using a celebrity, using Tom Cruise, and it looked incredibly real, um, but they're total falsehoods. And they are effective because we believe what we see and what we hear. And that's why what we hear and what we see on media is so incredibly powerful because it informs our belief systems. Researchers though have found that online hoaxes, like the one I just talked about, these deep fakes, actually spread 10 times faster than accurate or real news stories. And we're drawn to these stories because they are sensational or they're salacious. But we're also drawn to stories that align with our points of view. So psychologists have called these tendencies confirmation bias. And that's something that is very critical when we're talking about what we know and what we understand about Indigenous people in this country, what we've learned from day one of our learning process. Social media has allowed this confirmation bias to kind of supercharge this tendency to wildly share thoughts that align with our very own viewpoints. So we, we saw how fake news spread, like very um, strong examples through, for example, the US election. We also saw that as having far more reaching effects, fake news with the global pandemic. Um, and that's something that's been incredibly detrimental to, to life and death, essentially. And I wanna ask you to think about what does it mean when an entire group of people, thousands of people are posited not as they are? Um, not just for a few years since, you know, a technology like this was created, but sort of faked throughout uh, for their entirety um, for, for a century, um, who they are, how they live, our land, our history, how we've been treated for more than a century. What does that mean? Um, and, and thinking about as well to confront these beliefs, and that's what I want you to think about today, because when we're talking about media literacy or Indigenous realities literacy, I think people are really keen to have somewhat of a guide. What can I do to change my point of view or to understand Indigenous people better, or to better spot when there is inaccuracy and better to spot that in myself so I can change my behavior. So one of the things that's important to think about is you believe these fictions about Indigenous people or about fake news, not because you're not intelligent, but because the information itself has been skewed. But more importantly, we've been actually hardwired to believe what we want to believe regardless of the facts. That's why fake news is so prolific and so successful. So it's called cognitive bias. So once we form conclusions, they're really hard to change, even if we're presented with facts or evidence that contradict those conclusions. We seek information that we want to believe rather than what, what is the truth. And that's something that's been very critical in my career as a truth, as a truth seeker, someone who's in constant pursuit of the truth, but also of the way that we tell the truth and what truth we decide to tell. 
Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy for a second, but I think this is super important because it tells me that our belief systems are actually more than just having to do with our political biases, for example. They're actually hardwired within our brain. So the area responsible in our brain for reasons is called the theodorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's dormant when we're going towards something that we want to believe. We're actually, our, the, the part of our brain responsible for emotion, the orbital frontal cortex is actually hypercharged and we're getting hits of dopamine when we're attaching ourselves to a belief that we already believe or we think, we be, we, we think is true. So the upside of this confirmation bias, this is really important because when we're thinking about these, these the, the way that this information is processed in our brain and the way that our brain takes it in, it's important to understand why. It's sort of like a survival mechanism. Survival mechanisms, the flight, the, 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 flight, the, the freeze or the fight is a survival mechanism that is really important for, for our survival on a very sort of innate level to protect us. Um, so the upside of confirmation bias is that it could, could protect us from ideas to protect our tribe. So it's actually called identity protective cognition. And because we are highly social beings, it's more important to us to protect our values and our relationships with our friends and family than it is by losing, um, by adopting a new, a new set of beliefs. So when we're talking about a group, so a nation, Canada, um, that is founded upon land dispossession, oppression, and genocide of another group, think of how this scenario plays into this. And think about who you're relating to every day, your colleagues, take a look around the room. How many Indigenous people do you see beside you? How many Indigenous people are your neighbors? How many of your neighbors do you think or know are Indigenous? That's something that I hear all the time, is that, well, I don't see Indigenous people anywhere. I don't see them you know, at my local park, I don't see them at my local events. But that's because one of the most powerful um, types of fake news that's been projected on Indigenous people is stereotypes. And so I always tell people this, Indigenous people aren't out in the world performing for you. They're not practicing ceremony for you. They're not also um, in buckskin riding horses or in tunics picking clams from the ocean. Um, and that's one of the biggest misconceptions that is very ingrained in our minds today is that Indigenous people are still primitive beings that are not able to build, for example, a housing development in Kitsilano, or are not able to take part in a stock market, or would not just be your doctor or your lawyer or somebody you pass the street on. So this is really important for me as a journalist, as a storyteller, because even after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its data based on thousands of survivors' testimony. Some people still refuse that Indigenous people were harmed in residential school or that residential school itself was negative, was pejorative. Um, the large majority of Canadians still to this day refuse to believe that children died in schools, in the residential schools, or that a genocide happened here. And in fact, the way that we continue to tell ourselves, oh, I think it was a cultural genocide, but not an actual genocide, when we know that the regular definition of genocide actually fits into the United Nations definition of genocide is telling of how we still would love to see ourselves portrayed as this paradisimo of the world. This is something that I wanted to talk about today when I'm talking about um, my career as a journalist. It's something that I've struggled with my, my entire career is to tell an accurate picture of Indigenous people in Canada. So as an Indigenous journalist, and I, I'm using myself an example, but I want you to understand that this is something that Indigenous scientists, Indigenous educators, Indigenous um, medical professionals struggle with all the time as well. As Indigenous people, we're told, I'm told as a journalist, that if I talk about Indigenous people with the truth of the colonial violence that we've experienced, that I'm lying. I've been told this by executives, I've been told this by the public, I've been told this by other journalists, that what I, the pursuit of truth that I'm seeking is incorrect, because what I'm seeking is a lie. I'm told that this is a lie because people really see 
that what I'm saying, the truth that I'm like the Maxwell Johnson story, because it's wrecking the reputation of Canada, that it's hurting the pride of the pioneering spirit of settlers, that, is making, that it is making people feel guilty or shameful or that I am advocating for Indigenous people. And so I'm told that I'm biased um, because I'm Indigenous, because in some way I am being told that this is a conflict because I'm an Indigenous person trying to get this truth out. Um, even when I'm trying to show the beauty, the resilience, the love of Indigenous people that we were thriving for thousands of years pre-contact, I'm told that I'm not able to tell the story because I'm biased essentially because I'm an Indigenous person telling an Indigenous story. Things have changed. People always want to know about that. How have things changed over the years? Um, I think it's really important for us as a society to realize that our truth, our understanding of truth about Indigenous people surfaces for short. There's statistics, there's um, statistical analysis around this that has showed that when there's a crisis, for example, what happened to George Floyd, when the deaths of children in residential school came to light, there'll be a dip of public interest who really want to learn more about Indigenous people. And there'll be sort of like this invigoration of the public's keenness to educate themselves, to inform themselves, to better advocate for accurate information about Indigenous people. But then it dips down. And I always tell people too that it's really important for us as a collective society to understand these dips because we wanna to get to a place where we wanna learn deeply about indigenous people because we have compassion and we have empathy. I was recently told by a, a white man, a settler, that people like me only wanna share the truth about indigenous people to make people like him feel shameful and feel guilty. And that's not the case. Um, when I walk by the art gallery in downtown Vancouver, which right now I believe still is filled with the tiny shoes of representing the children that never made it home from residential school, I feel compassion and I feel love in my heart for learning, for understanding and for not giving up in, in, in this informa information gathering of myself, but putting it out there to the public. So it's really important when we're talking about how to change our points of view, how to rewire our brain to want to learn the truth, how to recognize when we are seeing fake inaccurate information about Indigenous people, um, it's important to understand that we want to look at this through a point of view of compassion. When I'm talking about the inaccuracies, you might be asking yourself, well, what is she talking about? I read news stories all the time and they're, they're, they're based on facts. Um, and a lot of them are. There's incredible work being done. My colleague um, Leanne is working on the story about Maxwell Johnson today about the update of his human rights case. And that story really took off. And that was a point, again, of crisis where people said, how could a 12 year old be arrested and handcuffed on a busy downtown street for trying to open up her first bank account? How could this happen today? Um, but within the stories, a lot of the stories that we see today still, they're laden with stereotypes or they're there's quotes within them by people who are not Indigenous, who don't come from a lived experience as an Indigenous person. And within that, there's inaccuracies about Indigenous people um, living in the stereotypes that we would, would like to see them in. I'm rushing a little bit because I want to get to questions if there are any. So please have a think about questions that you'd, you'd like to ask me. Um, so people always also ask me, how can we defeat this really built-in confirmation bias about Indigenous people? So there's actually no way to defeat the confirmation bias that we have in our heads, um, but there's some steps that you can take to get around it. So um, one of the things that um, was shared with me yesterday actually was a Navajo proverb that said, you cannot wake up a mountain that's pretending to be asleep. It's a really excellent analogy of, of the information we've been provided in Canada, where we've pretended or we've hidden the fact that we've done terrible things to the original inhabitants of this country, Indigenous people. Um, and I believe, I truly believe that one of the most important ways for us to um, really tackle this is to self-reflect. 
So I'm going to give you some, some three steps to think about when you're thinking about the confirmation bias, when we're thinking about rewiring our brain. So recognizing that you might have this bias in the first place, it's kind of like anything we do in society, you know, um, we're talking about if people are trying to quit alcohol, like the first thing that you would do is recognize that you have a problem. So pretty, pretty easy. This is where it gets a little bit harder. Consider that you might not understand what you think you understand. So researchers call it the illusion of explanatory depth. So let's say I strongly believe that GMOs are bad for me or that indigenous people were actually not here first and they were actually really lazy and incompetent and uncivilized um, before settlers arrived. Now, if someone forces me to explain that in my belief system, I might realize that I actually don't understand as much as I did before. Now, it might be that I have less confidence in my beliefs and more open to another point of view. So number three is research. Research can break down the opposing point of view. So looking at the opposing point of view, what if GMOs are actually not all that bad for me? Or what if indigenous people were actually here before settlers and actually had sophisticated governing systems, actually had sophisticated laws, actually had thousands upon thousands of people um, who, were, uh, who had incredible, powerful uh, communities. So researching the opposite point of view and you might see the other side, of the argument is actually a bit more shallow. So one of the ways you can do this is to pick a controversial topic and let research and facts to lay out what the other side believes to, to find out what you actually believe. Um, so I know that was kind of just like a, a metaphor and I feel like, did somebody turn off the light? So now I'm like brighter. Maybe you couldn't see me before. Now you can see me even more. Um, um, but I'm gonna um, kind of wrap up my talk here now so that people might have questions about me and my career. I know I sort of went over that really quickly, um, but my, my whole career has been built on attempting to educate people with the facts and information. Journalism, the bedrock of journalism is facts, but that's not something that we've seen when it is applied to Indigenous people. And that applies to all institutions, that applies to elementary school, that applies to high school, that applies to university, that applies to everyday social life that we're engaged in every day. And so, um, yeah, for me, it's, um, it's been a lifelong long goal to attempt to turn the tides, to attempt to address some of the inaccuracies, but also to try to build compassion in people. Um, that's something that um, I talk about a lot in my book, I'm Broken, which is coming out in September, which is about missing and murdered Indigenous women and building compassion for their stories. Um, I'm going to end it there, I think, to see if there's any questions. If there's not, I can keep on going. I don't know if there's anybody in the chat box. Okay, Angela, what I'm going to do is um, start getting a show of hands for questions, but uh, thank you for the thought provoking and assumption challenging uh, words that you have here. So if people could raise their hands if they have questions. Yeah, you're going to have some questions. So let's let's do that. Okay. All right. Anyone with a question? Um, Kim is at the back with a floating microphone and there's a standing microphone down here. They're both live, I believe. So either uh, raise your hand and, and Kim will bring you the microphone or make yourself way to this uh, microphone on the floor. And they're lining up. We can see you great, by the way. We can see you just fine. Awesome. Thank you so much. You bet. I don't know if we were able to set up you being able to see us the back of our heads or not. I can see the back of your heads. Yeah. <laughs> Is it working? Hello. There we are. There we are. Can you hear? Can you hear the? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for coming today. This was really exciting. I thought we were going to see you in the flesh, but I know me too. That's great. So we were hoping. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, with what we know about systemic racism and the whiteness of institutions in our country, I'm wondering how how difficult your sort of daily struggle is within the CBC and within an institution um, with the history that it has of um, you know. I grew up on white men doing um, journalism um, in CBC, and and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you see CBC's trajectory in their work against the systemic racism and their yeah, that's it. Yeah, 
Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think right now, you know, we saw again, like after the death of George Floyd, we saw this reckoning in media where people were really starting to self-reflect and go, yeah, we are um, not believing Indigenous people. We are taking the police accounts of a story more than we would an Indigenous person. And I think, I guess those crises points are are really incredibly important because they do force people to think and they do force institutions to look and reflect. And I think there's been massive moves. You can't deny that. Um, there's been many Indigenous people, Connie Walker, Duncan McHugh, who have pushed really hard to tell Indigenous stories with the accuracy that they deserve, with the rigor, with the investigation. I think that's something that we haven't seen historically is in you know, indigenous and non-indigenous reporters given the time and the resources to tell significant stories about indigenous people, indigenous communities and indigenous history. And I think that's changing, pardon me a little bit. I think where I'm at right now, given you know, more than a year to do a podcast about indigenous people and land dispossession from a trauma-informed indigenous lens is pretty telling and pretty significant. But I think just like every institution, there needs to be more. And I think there needs to be more in terms of people examining what does it mean to be upholding colonial violence? And that's probably really sounds extreme to people. What does it colonial violence mean? Colonial violence to me is having somebody come up to me and go, hey, Ange, let's go for a powwow. Or hey, Ange, that medicine bag around your neck is really ugly, like laughing in my face or telling me that I won an award just because I'm Indigenous. So the constant racism that Indigenous people experience, the constant stereotyping, the constant refusal to be able to speak out. And I think one of, I have a, a student named Kieran Lucas who was with me at Western this semester. And I said, let's like, like, let's just, let's look at the other side. Like, let's look at why, you know, media doesn't want to, for example, use the term, I think they're using it a little bit more now because they've been challenged, but they don't want to use, and I say the media because we're an institution. We represent a colonial institution. We are the media. So I know some journalists don't like that, but we are. We represent a, an organization. We're not individual people doing the things that we do. We are, but we're still represent and we're still part of that institution. Um, so for example, when indigenous people were saying, I want to be called a land defender, and the companies, the corporations, the media companies said, no, you can't use that because then why wouldn't you use like um, for the other side, say for the gas company, the um, purveyor of economic, um, uh, of economic prosperity, right? And so I got my students to really think about that. Like, well, why you, it, are we providing um, the indigenous land defenders a word that is in favor of them? And he said something that was so striking to me that made me rethink everything and, and think of things in a, in a very different lens. And I'll get to that in a moment. I just about went off track. But in a world, he said, in a society, in a country where we literally have the colonized versus the colonizers to this day, we can't be pretending or believing that we are coming to the table as equals. We're coming to the table like this with the settlers or the colonials up here and indigenous people down there. So you can't pretend that we're on an equal footing and somehow if we treat everybody the same, that we're somehow gonna get to the same place. That's just not true. And I think we really need to leverage our compassion in this world. Imagine if we treated everybody with an understanding of their, their um, where they're coming from historically, intergenerationally, not just as an individual who is somehow just a Canadian by virtue of being here. That's just not how society works. And so back to your question about media changing, yes, it's changing, but it is super slow moving. And oftentimes I feel really nervous that we're, we're trying to acknowledge that we're changing in a moment of crisis, but then when that moment has subsided, we're just going back to normal or going back to even a worse place. It kind of reminds me of when Donald Trump was elected, things can go, can get way worse, even if they've gotten significantly better. And so I think it's just up to us to constantly be recognizing and reckoning who we are as, as settlers, what we're bringing to the table 
and what, what we're bringing to the table in terms of the information and the data that we have, but also where we're meeting people in terms of that power imbalance. Thank you, Angela. answered your question. Yeah, that's, that's great. Do I see Nika at the microphone? I do. Great, so sorry. <laughs> Hi, Angela. Thanks for taking our questions and congratulations on your book as well. That's a Thank big you. thing. So, um, I was just, I guess, looking for an opinion from you on what you think we as individuals can do to try and further the truth and reconciliation in our own communities as grassroots individuals, not as companies? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think self-reflection is really, really important. And I say that as a person who isn't like, oh, I'm just an indigenous, so by osmosis, I'm you know, somehow absolved of stereotypes. I carry stereotypes and racism in my head and in my heart as well. And those guide our interactions with people. Um, and I think that the way to, you know, what I was just talking about before, like those three ways to sort of examine yourself. I think the last one, the research is so important. There's so much out there now that is written from an indigenous lens. And, and something I find really challenging sometimes is I'll be asked like, hey, have you heard of this book? And it's about indigenous people written by a white person and kudos, that's awesome. Like, that's amazing that there's more literature about indigenous people and that you know, settlers are wanting to pick up um, that ball. But, but read taken films by Indigenous people. You're going to see an incredibly different point of view. And I think one of the things that we really, the places that we need to get to in society when we're examining our own values is go, why does it seem for you that a white person is more important or that their perspective is more important or more valued than an indigenous person. I see this all the time. And, and sometimes I get caught in the, up in it too, like, oh, but the white person's gonna be able to explain it better than the indigenous person or make it a little bit more understandable. But we need to, we need to kind of ax that out of our psyche and go, the reason why I'm not seeing this indigenous person is as just as important or just as valued is because my perspective is either sanitized by or um, created by my whiteness and understanding the society. This isn't a radical concept. This is just how it is. If you do your research, you know the society is built, Canada is built on white supremacy. That's the essence of colonization and all about what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was about. And so understanding that, like chipping away at yourself and going, why do I see that? I have to do it all the time. Like, why am I seeing this white person's viewpoint or their expertise as more important? And why am I sanitizing my culture out of things? Understanding people's um, cultural laws, languages, um, but also really examining our own colonial violence and how that operates so freely and so significantly to this day, I think is, is critical. Um, and just like educating yourself. I have a, a, a friend at my son's school and she's constantly reading amazing books um, from the library about indigenous people and just tons of different viewpoints, realizing how non-homogenous we are too, I think is, is really critical. But I think that's like a step that you can do, even if you carve out, like, I'm gonna do this for 10 minutes, you know how you would say, I'm gonna like meditate for 10 minutes or I'm gonna like drink some water right now, set out a time, set a timer and go for 10 minutes, I'm gonna just learn about indigenous people from an indigenous perspective right now. Carve it into your schedule. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have other questions? I saw some other hands at the beginning. If you can make your way to a microphone, please. She won't be able to hear you otherwise. I can't wait for your podcast and your book, by the way. I know you've been <laughs> off working on that podcast, but we were scheduling around your, your podcast schedule here. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's been pretty a hard long on it. time. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave. I uh, coordinate English for the UBC Learning Exchange. Oh, awesome. And uh, I guess my question is, I, I like, because I know we're short of time and I really want to get to the point. Um, do you see a point where this will be like mandated into our curriculum languages i mean we're we're forced to take french yeah. right so i mean 
is there going to be a point in time when we actually see this stuff, you know, ingrained into the brain while they're in a, you know, influential age, right? That's the time to get them, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have two minds of that and I'll get to the positive part first. So I'm not sure how it is in the rest of Canada, but in BC right now, it is now mandatory for high school students to take, like it's not a extracurricular, it's not an elective, but you must um, take a, an indigenous studies class. That's huge. Hmm. I, I wasn't aware of this, but um, like when I grew up in high school, I would lie and pretend I wasn't indigenous. And I met, a, and I just thought like, oh, that's so old school. And I met this, um, this woman who was 20 and she was telling me the same thing. Like, I, oh, I just tell people like I'm Asian or South Asian or just anything but indigenous because of the racism. But what I didn't realize in talking to some of my university students who are in their 20s as well, like early 20s, is that they, they know very little. Like my, my courses have to be so 101 like very like, what is residential school? What is the 60 scoop? What like, you know, and it's really hard for me because I want to go deep. Like I want to have discussions that are invigorating and that are, you know, transcending these kind of one-on-one discussions about the truth. Um, but this mandatory course in high school is huge. That is actually amazing. And I just hope it's going to be taught again from an indigenous perspective. One of the problems I see even learning about trauma, for example, when we're learning this from a non-Indigenous perspective, what I'm finding and what I'm hearing is people just want to go into stereotypes immediately and not understand the complexity. Um, they want to just say, oh, oh, like that's why Indigenous people are so traumatized and like drinking and addictions. And there's this point of view where we start to have like less compassion and start to kind of blame and think of Indigenous people as living within these stereotypes without thinking of like, Angela Starr is this incredible journalist. What did it take for her to get here? And what are some of the things that she does to create a trauma-informed space, like speaking out against racism? Um, those are some of the things we need to celebrate in schools more. Your other question, or the other part of your question um, about when are we gonna see this, like not learning French, um, I have a very dismal answer for that. And I, I just feel like it's so slow that it's not, like it's just not moving. So I had a little boy who, that I did a story on. Um, he's Sim Shian, he had an elder, he had the curriculum and he wanted to take it in elementary school. He had everything lined up, but the school just, they couldn't find the path. So he, it came on him, like it came on him and his mom to do all the stuff. Like there was no path for him just to study. Even though he had all the stuff set up, there was no path. Like it, they came to the media because they were hopeless. They were at that point where they just couldn't, he couldn't learn his language in school and, and not have to take French. He still had to take French and he could do that on the side, but there was no pathway to institutionalize this. The other thing that is very problematic is that the government in British Columbia will not recognize indigenous languages in its like CODIS system. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, CODIS, but so they won't recognize indigenous names on birth certificates or indigenous businesses. You have to anglicize it. Like that's where we are in 2022. So that part I find very depressing and I find it very difficult when there's just like people doing these human rights cases and then the end point is like, maybe wait 20 years and then 20 years comes and there's an apology or, or something. And so there's like all this money put towards, you know, indigenous languages. I think in BC it was millions of dollars, like really high 60 million or something. But then there's these roadblocks that make it absolutely impossible to normalize indigeneity, like you said, in, in university. Like, can I just take a Sim Shian class? Well, it's incredible. It's not the same as French, where there's all these mechanisms set up because the government is supporting it systemically. So you can't just throw money at something and expect the indigenous people to pick up the pieces that colonization destroyed. There needs to be some accountability at an institutional level. And that's not happening, except for this mandatory course in high school from my point of view, which is incredible, but it's also concerning. Like who's gonna be, what materials are they gonna be using? Because we know, you all know in, in, in schools, you can pick your own, um, your own books, right? You can design your own curriculum. So how is that going to be disseminated? That's a little bit worrisome for me. Is it going to be all indigenous authors or is it going to be this very anthropological, like through a, from a lens of 
you know, the, the, the indigenous people are victims kind of thing, rather than from an indigenous lens, which is more empowering and more about tackling and getting accountability from systemic, from, from systems that have created this situation. So part of me is like very um, not hopeful. And then the other part is just like hopeful, but like worried. Um, but I, I, I don't see us moving the dial at all right now. I see us like we're, we're like we're not moving at all when it comes to what you're talking about, unfortunately. So we need people like yourselves to be like pushing and pushing because Indigenous people are forced to do it. And it's, it's exhausting. And um, we face more barriers um, simply because of racism within these institutions. There's some food for thought. Uh, thank you. I see one more question. There may be two. So let's get one more question at least and see where we are. Hello, Angela. Uh, my name is Lorelai. I'm from the Stoutly Up Nation. And I do have a question at the end, but I just wanted to add a few comments about um, you brought up colonial violence and what is it? Um, it does still go on. For me, colonial violence is when I walk down the street and people look me up and down with a skull on their face. When I get propositioned on the street on the basis of what I look like, they think that I, they can, I can be bought for a shot of whiskey or a mug of beer. Colonial violence is when in university, as the sole Indigenous person in my class, everyone expected me to have all the answers for all Indigenous related questions. Um, Colonial violence is when you watch TV or read a magazine or watch a movie or a TV show and the native people that are depicted there are stereotypes. <laughs> um, and you also brought up colonized versus colonizers. Uh, that bilateral duality or whatever you wanna call it is a form of colonial violence because yeah. it is the colonizers are looking down on the colonized and asking why they can't defend themselves when the colonizer's boot is on the colonized person's neck, literally. So there's some observations. And uh, my question is to do with uh, the media, like general stereotypical media. <laughs> Um, does the media have a policy of education for uh, executives and reporters, et cetera, uh, about re-educating themselves about Indigenous history and about the TRC 94 recommendations? Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for like very articulately laying that out. Um, people need examples. We need to see that when we're talking about these ideas that are realities like colonial violence, we're not just being, we're not exaggerating. And those are really brutal examples that you provided. And I'm so sorry that you have to deal with that and that so many of us have to deal with that. And like what she was saying there, that's something I've heard in media, that that's something I've been asked to cover. Um, hey, Ange, why don't you cover why all the indigenous Native youth on commercial drive are all drunk all the time, literally, like that was last year. Um, things like that. Um, and that's that's like hearing me on the radio every day talking about colonial violence, talking about the 60s scoop, residential school, the millennial scoop, talking about all this stuff every day. And then I'm asked to do something like that. This is something that Indigenous people experience every day today. And this is, these are the thoughts that go through people's minds and the things that they say out loud. And it's atrocious. And we shouldn't even need examples that are that brutal to show people that their behaviors, that our actions, that our institutional collective beings are violent towards indigenous people. Um, and that's something that I really hope people will examine more. Um, so thank you so much for giving me those examples because I wasn't as articulate as you in, in spelling out some of the examples that I have because it's frustrating and it's emotional and we sh it shouldn't be up to us to have those words come out of our mouths um, to, to share them to a larger public. Um, the media does not have anything that you're talking about and it needs to. <laughs> um, 
often when we're, you know, there's tons of amazing, um, like young settler um, people in my newsroom who are like, I want to like get this right. And I want to learn this. Can we have a project to do this? And it's like, oh yeah, you can totally do that after work. Like you can totally do that on your time. And that's not acceptable because you're telling us that you are not seeing this as a priority and you're not putting resources towards this in a matter that we can do within our work day. We're having to do this on our free time. So it's not an institutional change. Um, so there's nothing like that. Um, but there's tons of, of people who would like to see that. Um, I don't know about other stations, but for us, we have like mandatory bias training, which I actually found problematic in itself, like the way they were depicting an indigenous woman, like, I don't even want to say, but I was just like, who drew this cartoon of us? Um, just totally like a stereotypical, like the whole thing you can imagine. Uh, it's like, we, we don't look like that. Um, but you can just click through it, right? So when you take these, I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. They're provided these things that you must review, you know, for like, it's mandatory. So you can have this video playing while you're working, or you can skip through to the next thing and, and just say yes. So there's nothing where it's like, which is actually really effective, which is small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. And there's different ways that um, institutional change can happen. And it usually has to do with bigger groups and then smaller groups, smaller groups, and then one-on-one, -on -one, depending on the person's level of like ignorance or interest, I guess. But there's been a lot of data to show that people don't learn as much in big groups because they're afraid to speak out and they're afraid to actually work on their own issues. So yeah, media has nothing like that. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, and yeah, I recently I was asked to provide a bunch of examples and I, I was just like, I can't, like I, the examples that I had, like there's so many examples that it, you could just any, you could pick any news story and go through it to see the types of stereotypes that are in news stories every day today. Um, like it doesn't, it doesn't take much. So yeah, it's, it's very problematic. And when it comes to the TRC recommendations, I think somebody else asked this as well. Um, there's the calls to action, um, but that's, so there's, you know, recruit more indigenous people. That's one of the TRC's calls to action. So that's something, you know, media finds very easy to do, but that's problematic when you're bringing in indigenous people in, into a racist, an unsafe environment for indigenous people without letting them know like these people, like these like 80% of settlers aren't gonna accept you if you're outward in your indigenous identity. You know, if you're not whitewashed or you're not sanitizing yourself or having these colonial behaviors, then you're not gonna be accepted. So some of the, um, the calls to action that media is taking up right now I find actually more problematic than not. And I think what you just said about instituting some education around the history of indigenous people is more necessary than recruiting or retaining indigenous people, which isn't happening right now in terms of the retaining because people are leaving because it's, it's not safe to be an indigenous person in a media outlet right now for a variety of reasons. Wow, thank you. Um, Ralph, did you have a question? Or Okay, I've got one final question then for you from one of our board members, uh, Ralph St. Clair. Hi, Angela. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. There's tons of things I'd like to talk to you about in the presentation, <laughs> um, but I could learn a lot, but I don't think we have time. Um, my name is Ralph. I'm a board member at Dakota and I work at UVic. And uh, I don't know if you can tell on the camera or not, I'm also an old white guy. <laughs> so... <laughs> I strongly, strongly believe that a lot of the responsibility for making things better lies on people who look a lot like me. And in the audience today, we have people from 100 different communities across BC, uh, from Ontario, from other places in Canada, and so on. And working at UVic, one of the priorities that I see all the time is Indigenous language revitalization and how important that is as an anti-colonial step and as a step in indigenizing our curriculum and our institutions and so on, it, it's hard to separate the political project from the language. And it seems to me that community-based literacy providers have some things in common with the indigenous language revitalization efforts. And perhaps we could walk together for a while 
and I'd be really interested to hear your, your thoughts on this idea. Does it make sense to you? And do you have ideas for how concretely this could happen? I know it's a little bit out of your expertise, um, but I'd just love to hear your thoughts generally. Thank you. Can you um, say that one more time, like bringing Indigenous language learners into community? Yeah, do you want the whole thing all over again? No, <laughs> just the, just the no, one Ralph. part about the no. <laughs> yeah. There are people in the room going, no, Ralph, don't do that all over again. Um, so the, the, inter the interesting thing is that I see, for example, with Hassanich School Board, which is um, on the Hassanich Peninsula, I see both literacy learners in terms of learning um, English and the standard Western school curriculum, but mm. I also see people, a, a real and effective effort to revitalize Sanjotan as a language. And I'm just wondering how we could work together in those efforts, because it seems to me that w there's a huge synergy there and some commonality of interest. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I met with the um, Lieutenant Governor, Jean, Jean Austin, is that right? Austin, Jean yes. Austin. Yeah, Janet um, and she was learning Sanjotan and she was speaking it in the, um, in uh, the ledge and then when she brought some elders with her and it's amazing the efforts that they are um, engaged in right now to revitalize their language. I think like one of the, the important parts of, of learning indigenous languages is understanding the importance of being on the land, but also understanding that like 80% of us don't live on our land anymore. Like I don't live back home at all and it's so far away. Uh, when I go back, you know, it's usually very quick and it's, there's just not that potential. And so I do think like going back to what I was saying about instituting, not that I would want to institutionalize <laughs> Indigenous people more, but I think there is something to be said about um, some of the efforts that I see right now. Like I see people from like the KT community learning their language and revitalizing it in universities. And a lot of it is really complex because um, sometimes they have to meld different languages together to understand their own language and there's no language learners like so people have to revitalize it back so I think like every community is very different in terms of their needs in terms of their language speakers and in terms of how endangered their language is um, and I think it's just very individualistic but I do think what I was just talking about like when we see you know, someone like Cheyenne Cunningham from Katsy, who is like such an incredible leader and she's, you know, um, doing such incredible work to revitalize the language and to create more language speakers. And I think it was, there's a formula to it. It's like um, teaching, I think it's like 17 people in your community 101 and then teaching those people to teach. Like there's a total formula for it that I don't have on the tip of my tongue. But I think having someone like her then not be able to create her business in her language and not be able to live in this society that we all live in. Like we're not gonna go just live in our communities and just stay there. Like that's just not how we are living. But to have these blockades, like to have the Simshian boy not be able to have any roots to learn his language in school, to have this woman not be able to have her indigenous language on a sign for her business, to have someone not be able to register their baby in their language like these are institutional failures that people like yourself could really advocate for and there and the, the the weird thing about it is there's there's like tech nerds settlers who are like well, we can do this there's a way but for whatever reason there's some sort of bureaucracy in the background that is preventing this from happening and you know I've done stories where I've told people like people are telling me this is really bad. Like you can't, for this is one example, you can't have people on your website advertised as if they're, they're children, but as if they're puppies and they're, they've been removed immediately. And so there's things like that that happen very quickly, right? When it comes to reputation. So there, it just boggles my mind why things like that in an, in an institutional level can't be pushed forward. Why is it taking 40, 50, 100 years? So I think people like you pushing and advocating or making the routes for these things to happen that are very like normalizing. How can we normalize indigenous languages? And so I see a lot of people like yourself being like, well, I'm gonna learn like with Jane Austen learning the language like and speaking the ledge, like that's great, but that's her privilege, right? And not everyone is able to do that or register their baby or have their business or normalize it. So 
I think we need people like you to advocate for some of those routes to happen because it's it's ridiculous that that you can't just learn Simshian in elementary. You have to still learn French. So I think we need people pulling the levers to make these routes possible for Indigenous to normalize, normalize us speaking our language. Because people always ask me, like, how do you know when a place is decolonized? So that's how you know. We will you'll know when we're not speaking English, right? <laughs> so that shows you we're here. You know, we have to go way over here. We're really we're really not making progress. So I think what you're doing talking about languages, that's where we need to go, but we need to think about all these sort of huge barriers that isn't just like, um, you know, time or energy or language speakers, it's like the colonial bureaucracies pushing us back. Hope that made sense. <laughs> It does. Thank you. And thank you, Ralph, for the question. Um, uh, and before we thank you, I just want to say these calls to actions. I know that I'm looking at the room. I know you can't see all the faces, but this is an incredibly thoughtful room right now. And um, awesome. I just got emotional. Um, I heard a call to action and I happen to love advocating and I know some people. So yeah, I'm going to be advocating. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your thoughtful talk. Thank you very much for challenging us and giving us jobs to do and things to think about. We appreciate your time. We can't wait to see your podcast and your book. And we will be sending you a pair of purple Dakota socks to thank you for coming <laughs> and visiting us today. Thank you.